And we're back with Transform Your Relationships Live. I'm Laura Rubenstein here with the awesome and fabulous Dr. Roberta Shaler. Hi, Roberta. Hi, Laura. And we've been missing in action with Thanksgiving holidays and all kinds of things. So we're delighted to be back and continuing with what we started in our last uh, broadcast. We talked about creating connection. Now we want to move that forward into how do you create and turn connection into collaboration if that's what you want. And if you're in a romantic relationship, you want it. You do, because the opposite or the antithesis of collaboration is competition. And you don't really want that in a relationship. No. Although I, I sense that there is a lot of competition in some relationships. So we want to dive deep into that, you know, what is this collaboration process that we can bring into relationship? How do you divide, define that? Well, I think it is defined by what I say are the three must-haves of a healthy adult relationship, any healthy adult relationship. And that's that it has equality and equity, reciprocity and mutuality. So if we want to create collaboration, that means that we're going to have those three things. They are going to be the basis of our relationship and that will allow us to collaborate on wanting one another's best interest, for instance, or wanting to feel like someone can trust us and we can trust them. So it, we need to move to collaborative things because the competition, you can just feel it in your body when someone's saying the words like, yes, let's do that, we, 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 and you can feel it and they're going, what's in it for me? How can I get more than the other person? And you can, you can feel that. So we have to be really aware of that. Yes. And when it's so subtle and we're so used to buying into other people's stories that if, if we're not careful, we could fall into the trap of like, this isn't collaborative. This is dictatorial. This is competitive. We've set ourselves up for competition. Mm -hmm. So what might be some key identifiers for collaboration versus competition? Well, first of all, the obvious, I guess, is that people say they'll do something and they don't. So they put something ahead of it and they say, well, you know, I got busy. Okay, so that just tells me that our agreement had a lower place in your priority list than what you wanted to do. <laughs> um, so that's not collaborative. Now, of course, I mean, things do go sideways occasionally. But if you work with somebody who shows you that it's not the priority that it sounded like, take that on board. Realize that hmm, maybe this isn't as collaborative as I thought. Um, maybe a person has an underlying competitive agenda that they may not even realize because they have tendencies to narcissistic behaviors. So they're always thinking what's in it for me not consciously, that's just their basic operating principle. So, you know, I've worked with people who sound lovely and, and collaborative and patient and overgiving even. And you can feel underneath like, no, I'll buy that domain. I'll do that. I'll do this. I'll do that. And they, they think you don't notice that they are trying to own the process. And you do notice if you're aware and then you know we're not in a collaborative spirit. They're endeavoring to own what you're doing. So you can see things like that as well. Yeah. And when they're in that, you know, me, me, me state, but it seems like they're taking care of the whole process, there is that competitive edge. There is that feeling like, why are they so eager? Why, you know, I don't feel like I got a word in edgewise or, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's things you can do to check in. I mean, I think there's sometimes there's people who really want to overgive too. So there's this, it's not necessarily going to be someone in it for themselves, but it isn't not necessarily collaborative. How can we foster more collaboration? Well, I think we have conversation about it. We communicate about it. Bring it out in the open. You know, simply say, you know, how can we make this the most uh, collaborative thing possible? Or, you know, I I think we should 
we could make a list of the things that each are going to do and make sure that they're equal. You know, things that encourage the premises of collaboration, like equality, reciprocity, and mutuality, mm -hmm. and then converse about it. Because what many people do who don't feel confident in their communication skills, they'll not speak up in the relationship they're troubled by, but then they'll go and they say, oh, you'll never guess what this person's doing. And they don't handle what's actually going on with the person. And so we can get into those kind of places, which are really not emotionally mature places. So being able to just initiate a conversation, you know, let's make sure that this is an equal endeavor. I don't want either of us to feel overburdened or take on too much, right? And just globalize the process like that, rather than saying, I think you are trying to own this project, because <laughs> that yeah. will not work. <laughs> and I think you hit on something um, that can be useful, which is documentation. So you mm -hmm. said make a list. If there's any resistance to that process, then that could be a red flag. I think collaboration works best when we're all on the same plane. And to get on the same level plane, you know, on the playing field, if you write it down, first of all, you have to think through it a little bit more clearly. Yeah. And then it's in writing, right? It's mm -hmm. it's like we can both go back to this document and and tweak it and work on it together. And that's what you want. You want it to be like a Google Doc that both have editing access to mm -hmm. and both are able to um, connect to and have input, equal input on, and then evaluate for its equality versus saying, oh, no, no, that's okay. I'll just do all of this. And then that might not feel right to the other person. And that's your opportunity if you're the other person to say, well, I don't feel right about this. I want it to be equal and I want to, I want to be, I need to see it on paper, right? Yeah. So, or on a digital space. <laughs> well, anybody who's not willing to put it on paper is a red flag to me anyway, because they, they mean they want it to be movable. They want it to be a, you know, they can, they can manage the process the way they want to. Perhaps, I mean, not everybody wants to do that, but and so many people just think, oh, I got it all in my head. I don't need to write it down. But when you're collaborating with someone in the workspace, which is basically what we're talking about right now, we need more tools like that. Sometimes you even need them in your personal collaboration with a partner or your parent or your sibling. Because once it's in black and white, then everybody goes, Ooh. <laughs> I, I can't fudge it. The words are on the page, you know, and that's often important too. Yeah. I often have couples and say, you know, you're not collaborating, you're competing with each other. We need to have some ground rules and we need to have them signed by both of you uh, so that we can say, you know, I'm living by the agreement as opposed to you're not. But, you know, in the in the agreement, it suggests this, let's do that, is a much more positive thing to do than to say, why did we bother writing this agreement? You're not doing it anyway. You know, we always want to be moving our communication forward in the best way, as opposed to the finger of blame, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when we have a document, even in a romantic relationship, a husband, wife, a partnership relationship of any kind that is tight and long lasting or intended to be, sometimes it just clarifies everything. You know, I have when I work with clients and I know that their relationship is really troubled, there are ground rules and they have to agree. And, you know, you can see the wheels turning like, oh, I'm accountable now that I've written that down. Uh, yes, you are. <laughs> and it helped. I think it could be a tool for those couples who want to move towards evolu evolving their relationship to more collaboration. It's a tool that will ha help foster that because we have the habit of not being mm -hmm. that. So this can foster. I just started um, inviting my husband by uh, calendar invites to things because this way, I know it's been communicated and it's somewhere he can reference and I don't have to worry about, did I communicate it six mm -hmm. times so he does remember it? It's like, okay, it's there. I might remind a couple of times, but now it's a tool that I, 
I think we'll get used to using. It's brand new, so I don't know how it's going to work, but it's just another thing that just promotes the spirit of collaboration. It's like, hey, are we on the same page here? We have this calendar and we're going to start sharing calendars more so we can know what the other is doing so we know when the other has free time, that kind of thing. Yeah, and that also in a primary relationship removes one of the ways that we get into a parenting relationship with our partner. Like you just said that you don't want to be reminding your partner over and over and over. You start to sound like their mother. Right. Um, so if you have a trust factor that says, okay, we make an agreement, we're going to use this software and we're going to sync our calendars. And then I don't have to remind you and you don't have to remind me. And yes, there'll be some wiggle room in the beginning because people will forget, but, you know, committed to the process that will work out really well. And it will remove that nag factor mm -hmm. that sometimes comes up. Right. Good idea. Great idea. And you've mentioned the word agreement a lot. And I think that's important to highlight because too many people make assumptions versus agreements. Mm -hmm. And I think if we, if we keep, I heard this quote over the weekend, it's like um, better to make agreements on assumptions or assumptions, you know, I don't remember the exact quote, but it was the difference between when you put something together that we, that both parties can agree to and it's in writing <laughs> in one way, shape or form, whether it's a list on a refrigerator, on a countertop, on a computer, a calendar, it's an agreement and we're clear. We can, we can yeah. reference it. We don't, there's no ambiguity. There's no manipulation of it. Um, and it just makes everyone relax a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It, it, it relies on a process rather than on the neg factor, because one of the things that happens, particularly in close couples relationships is that we just, we just get fatigued having to tell our partners over and over and the partners being told over and over wants to be trusted. And, you know, the reason we tell them over and over usually is because they can't be trusted because they, they come to rely on us taking care of them. And then we remove that factor of equality. And as soon as we do that, relationship troubles begin. Yeah. And then it's frustrating instead of freeing. And I think the structures that we're talking about, the agreements, the lists, the calendars, whatever you, works for you actually allows for more freedom and, and just being related and mm -hmm. knowing that there has been some level of communication clarified. And I think that's a lot of collaboration is making sure your communication was okay. received on the other side. Yeah, I think that's the difference. You know, I make this distinction between communicating and communication. A communication is an email, a text, a poster on the wall. <laughs> Communicating is sending something, having the other person recognize that they've received it and letting you know and getting back to you. Then we have a two-way street. Communication is push it out. But communicating is the tennis game, back and forth. And I've been talking a lot with clients recently about your communication should be like a relaxed game of catch or a agreed upon rally in tennis. Nobody's trying to catch the other person out. We can trust that nobody's trying to smash you in the face with the ball. Uh, all of those things we want our communication to be, our communicating to be, like we would play catch with a seven-year-old. You know, we want them to catch it. We want them to have that success. Let's do that with our partners too, by communicating in such a way that they can catch it and it doesn't hurt them. I find that uh, a curiosity approach in communication really works well for me. Um, it's like, I'll ask a question like at breakfast, could I have a, one of your pancakes or can I have a pancake? And this morning he said, yes, but he didn't realize it was, and I didn't realize he, there was a, a miscommunication in the sense that there were three, th three pancakes on his plate. And I thought that was all that was left in the refrigerator. So I took one and he goes, there's more in the refrigerator. I'm like, oh, I didn't realize that. So put it back on his plate and got one, but it was playful. It was curious. It wasn't like, 
he was mad at me for taking his pancake. <laughs> yeah. You know, so because that could have evolved into, you know, I, in another type of dynamic, a, a, a really sense of resentment. She's eating my food, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think, too, in that case, a prior question, a prefacing question is, are there more pancakes <laughs> would be uh, yeah. a, I mean, a think about it, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I because he he's always finishing up the leftovers, right? So I made that assumption, right. and um, you know we had to jostle around, and so it's not going to be perfect. We're not always going to think of the right question to ask, but yeah. the mindset is always curious. So he kept one with me, and I kept one with him, and we got to the the place through bumping up against um, different realities, right? My reality was there was no none in the in the. Uh, so I thought in the refrigerator and his was, there's more in the refrigerator. So why, why do you, you want the ones on my plate? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I you think know. there's another distinction too, Laura, that goes with that one. And I, I remember teaching my kids this because I raised my kids alone and, and I would, they would, they would make assumptions like you say. And so I remember my youngest son, six foot five, you know, 15 years old. And wow. he would say things like, um, well, I just know you're not going to let me go to that thing on Friday night. And I would look at him and say, do you now? Was that a question or a statement? And he would look at me and think and think and think. And then he'd say, can I go to that thing on Friday night? Ah, yeah, let's talk about the thing on Friday night. Tell me about it and we'll make a decision. But you start from that place, I would tell him, that already says, I don't want to be wrong, so I'm going to assume something. And so, well, you won't let me go on Friday night. Oh, okay. <laughs> right? Like you've already made up my mind for me. If you're going to gaslight me like that, okay, you can't go. I mean, mm -hmm. you've already decided you can't go. And, you know, it took a long time because it was just that always thing. Are you going to ask a question or make a statement? And there was a competition in there. Like, I've got to be right about this, you know. Um, so well, it, he kind of hijackly. So <laughs> he did have to be right. And it was a big learning and a big change in the communication when he stopped making assumptions and asked a question. Mm -hmm. Because his assumption would come as a statement of, you know, this is the way it is. You won't let me go on Friday night. Okay. I won't then, I guess we had this conversation in some other planet and you have decided this. <laughs> and he, you know, of course, when I talked like that to my kids, it was like, oh, mother, you know, but um, that's just a good example. Yeah. Like, ask a question, don't make a statement. Yeah. And the, it seems like there's so much invested sometimes in people wanting to be right. And that fosters that com competition. Like I'm right, you're wrong, right? There's this dichotomy thing. And um, a mentor of mine said years and years ago to me, you can be right or you can be in relationship. <laughs> so, you know, That's asking right. that question and not assumption, assuming gets us back into collaboration, gets us back into relationship. It doesn't divide us. It brings us together. And I think that's the whole point of like, let's, create that connection so we can collaborate. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we've also heard the question, would you rather be right or happy? And, you know, if, if you are in a, a relationship where you have to be right all the time, which hijackals have to be right all the time, you are going to have this constant difference of opinion, this constant uh, lack of equality. And I, there's a wonderful Michael, Byer, Michael Byers song that, I don't know, I probably, he wrote it 25 years ago. Um, but in it, he's talking about couples and assumptions and things. And he says, so we're still going to argue over whose truth is a little more true. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's just such a fabulous insight because that's what happens. We're bargaining for position. We're looking to raise our profile in the conversation. And so we want to be right. Or we're not listening to the other person because we're so fixated in getting what we want. And so there isn't collaboration because now there isn't that 
relaxed game of catch or a, a volley or rally, you know, and whether you're playing tennis or you're playing volleyball and you're just trying to practice doing things that you're not trying to catch anybody out with it. You're not trying to hurt. You're not trying to make that one up move. You know, aren't I clever? I can smash this into the, you know, into the front of your court and you're playing tennis. Well, we lost all the momentum. We lost all the relaxation. We, we switched from collaboration to competition. And we've all had that happen in, in conversations. And it's a big red flag, you know, my favorite prop. But these these <laughs> red flags, when when people show us who they are, believe it, you know. Um, Maya Angelou was right, you know, we need to do that. Yeah. And so many times we don't want to. We make excuses and, and we don't get curious, as you were saying, Laura, to say, oh, do I have this right? Is this what you just said? Um, and, and hold it up to show them that you were listening. And then you can equalize the conversation or at least attempt to. Mm -hmm. Like you did with your son. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like it, it's always a possibility that we can equalize the conversation and maybe even have to insist on equalizing the conversation and notice when it is like, if you're with a hijack, all the conversation will never be equalized. So it's really important to see that. Now, who cares on the small stuff? You know, you want Thai food this week and I'll have Chinese next week. <laughs> okay, who cares? But if it's which school we're gonna send our child to or what medical decision are we going to make, we care. So let's learn how to collaborate on those decisions before we get into a crisis situation or we create one. Is it possible to collaborate with a hijackle? No. <laughs> okay. They have so no we're intention. talking about people who are willing to be collaborative versus the people who always, it's always about them. Yeah. When you're with a hijack call, anybody who has passive aggressive, narcissistic, sociopathic, psychopathic, uh, histrionic traits, they don't have to have a diagnosis. But, you know, these people are based on hijacking a relationship for their own purposes and interests and then scavenging it for power, status and control. So when you hear all those words put together, you know, oh, there's not going to be compromise. There's not going to be collaboration. Compromising with a hijack all is they think they're already in the middle when they make their position. Right. <laughs> like I am and I am in the middle and you come to me. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we have to notice those things. They don't have collaborative bones in their body, except when they believe they're winning. Like if right. they can always be on top of the, the pile, that's great. So if they work with somebody who doesn't care about the credit, just cares about getting the job done well, and they want to take all the credit, sometimes that can work. But if we're in a truly collaborative relationship where we are both the authors of whatever's happening, it won't happen that way. <laughs> No. And if you're, if you're in primary relationship with one, it's always one upmanship. It's always, you know, they're going to either look down their nose at you or say something demeaning. And if they're not feeling like they're on the top of the pile, they have to push you down into the mud. Um, no matter how low they are on the pile, they'll still have to push you into the mud <laughs> in order to meet their need to be right. Right. And these are very important things to see, but you will not have collaboration unless it's, you know, sort of Bernie Madoff, if you like, like <laughs> we're collaborating. I'm going to invest all your money. Isn't this wonderful? I'm going to make you millions. Give me your money. That sounds like collaboration. And then they go off and turn into somebody who is only interested in their own um, well-being financially in that case and uh, they have all your money and you think you had trust yeah. so it looked collaborative in the beginning but remember i say so often to everybody on my podcast and all abb always re believe behavior <laughs> always believe the behavior it speaks volumes you know i it's it's challenging to hear you know how do you actually collaborate with a hijackle? And the answer is you don't. 
And what I heard is you actually need strategies to, yeah. to deal with it. So once you recognize it's not the normal rules no longer apply. Yeah. And you do need strategy to protect yourself and to not, you know, be pummeled down so much is, is what I. Well, you can collaborate with a hijack or Laura, but it's not going to be 50-50. <laughs> It'll be a different kind of collaboration. I yeah, guess. you may you may get an eighty twenty out of it, and you may get something done. Just don't expect it to be equal. It won't be. Right now, let's talk about fear of collaboration. So a lot of people are codependent. A lot of people feel like they are afraid to collaborate because it might not work out, or they're lone rangers, so they have to revert to lone rangers. What does that bring up for you? Well, lone rangers are interesting because many of them have an attachment style that is avoidant or dismissive. And so they they don't know how to work with others. Mm -hmm. They don't find others uh, reliable. They're not going to take the risk. Um, so, no, I'd rather do it myself. And you'll find that uh, attachment style is a big issue, but it is basically created in the first 24 months of our life. Hmm. And so we can be in situations, you know, like a lone ranger would also have this thing, something terrible would happen to them and people would come and say, let me help you. No, I'm fine. I can manage it on my own. I don't need any help. I'm good. Because they're so used to, I can't trust anybody. I'm mm -hmm. not going to be vulnerable with anybody. I'm not going to let anybody in or rely on anybody because I can't trust them. I learned when I was four months old that they're unreliable. They drop me. They don't come when I cry. They're not there. They never smile at me. So now I don't trust people. So I will do it all myself. And then I may even become a martyr, mm -hmm. you know or at least use martyr kind of language to say, no, it's fine. No one ever helps me. I've learned to do it all by myself. <laughs> I find a lot of people now feel like they put themselves down for, for not being good at accepting help. Um, no, I, I'm not good at asking for help. So they kind of turn that Lone Ranger thing into, I'm just not, it's not possible for me. You know, they kind of shut the door on it. Mm -hmm. Well, that tells us a lot when somebody says, you know, I don't need any help. Then we need to get that curiosity we're talking about and saying, well, I was thinking that I might be able to do this, this, and this. Would that be helpful? And allow them to generate something that feels safe that they would allow for that. Um, but if they're totally shut down, uh, then then you, when they complain to you that they ended up doing it all by themselves, a good thing to say is, yeah, that's unfortunate because I demonstrated my willingness to help right. and and to remind them that they didn't have to, but they chose to. Right. So those Lone Rangers, yeah, they need to know that they're choosing it versus, mm -hmm. and it's hard to get out of these habits of like, okay, well, I'm used to doing it on my own. I do it well myself. Um, and if I bring in a collaborator, it's going to make it messy and longer. Um, longer and it's not going to get done the way I want it. And there's all these really good justifications. And, um, but then you have to live with the consequence of being exhausted, burnt out. Um, you know, it's, yeah. so there's there, yeah, there are things to weigh for sure. Uh, if you're a lone ranger versus a collaborator. And there's nothing wrong with being a lone ranger. I mean, if you want, if you are very competent and, you know, like people ask all the time, may I write for your website? No, you may not, because <laughs> people come there to hear me. <laughs> right. um, that's why they come. They don't want to hear other people. Um, so I don't want to collaborate in that situation. So I could be called a lone ranger, mm -hmm. you know. But on the other hand, um, I love to do things with people. Look how long you and I have been doing this. Yeah. And, and it's, it's great fun. And we, we learn and we grow and it deepens our relationship. Um, but I could say, well, I'll just do it alone. I could do this alone. Well, it's not as much fun. So why would I? <laughs> right. <laughs> I have a podcast. I do it alone. And that's great. And I like the balance of having a collaborative event. Mm -hmm. And so we just need to maybe open our minds to where am I allowing collaboration in my life? And could I do a little more? Yeah, I love that question. 
it's a it's a it's a challenge at the same time because you know there are certain places we do collaborate and then i'm thinking wow i'm sure there are more places so it mm-hmm. opens up a whole new world and i know you have a community that you've created the emerging empowered community that is kind of also a collaborative space. Would you agree in some way? It certainly is because people are trusting one another with their their pain or their questions, and then everybody chimes in. <laughs> and then in Emerging Empowered, um, twice a month, uh, you get a group Ask Me Anything call with me for an hour and 15 minutes. So we then talk about it. We learn about each other. We meet each other. We see each other in the Zoom call. And then we look forward to the next one. Like, how did that turn out for you? Um, What did you implement that we talked about? And that builds community. And when you're isolated by a hijack call, you need that community. Mm. So come on over to joinintoday.com. We have a big deal happening um, on the next Ask Me Anything call for members. I'm doing a a webinar uh, as a bonus on um, handling hijackals at holidays and celebrations because that's the worst time to ever count on a hijackal because they have to take it over and ruin it in one way or the other. Either they insist on doing it all their way or they refuse to do it and make you make decisions. (laughs) Very, very difficult. So, yeah, there's a lot there at joinintoday.com. And they can find out about that webinar at joinintoday.com? Well, no, they can't because it's a members only thing, but oh, okay. <laughs> if they want to come, they can join in. <laughs> okay. So join and then you'll get it. Got it. Cool. Yeah. Um, it's really important. The holidays. It's on the 18th. On December 18th, 2021. Mm-hmm. So um, being able to handle hijackles in the holidays can make for a better experience to the holidays or at least mitigate some um, negative experiences that you're anticipating in your mind. And I know that that can be yeah. very freeing. Well, hijackals ruin holidays. They also ruin celebrations. That's why it's in the title. If you've had an accomplishment, something wonderful has happened to you, they will try and take credit or they'll tr- they'll say they're not coming and want you not to go. You know, I had a hijackal godfather and when i got married my godmother made my dress did absolutely everything she was so thrilled Mm. and on the morning of my wedding he said i don't want you to go and i'm not going to go either right like that's what hijackals do right yeah so you know joinintoday.com is a great place but if you're looking for a wonderful gift for a woman in your life they could buy the feminine power cards couldn't they they can yes femininepowercards.com is the uh, wisdom cards the feminine wisdom cards that are available with um, john gray's endorsement about that they are like having a relationship coach in your pocket you know i just like to have them here everybody i hand them to it's uncanny roberta they start flipping through it and they go, I love this. I love this. I'm like, great. They still work. <laughs> you know? no, yeah, but they're, really, a- they're really comforting uh, source of inspiration and wisdom. And also on one side is a feminine power uh, principle. And on the other side is a practice. And this happens to be a journaling question on that card. So um, yeah, they're fun. So lots for you. We're glad that you were with us today and and enjoy the conversation. Make sure to um, join us, you know, on our Facebook page at Transform Your Relationships Live on Facebook. Yes, we'll see you there and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Roberta. Thanks, Laura.